I, The Dragon Overlord Chapter 71, He Who Changed Dragon City, 2. Old John walked out of the house after saying goodbye to his wife and children. The morning sun beat down the fragrant earth, and the chirping of birds gave the air a delicate vibrancy. Morning Old John. Hey, John. Heard you were transferred to the noble district to work? Is it true that the Lord gives more flour and meat to those who work there? Support us at Hosted Novel. I heard that the supervisors there are all elves. Hey, are they really as beautiful as the rumors say? I've seen some elves before, and they are really pretty regardless of their gender. Old John's neighbors poured out in droves to meet him. Although their clothes were of poor quality and showed signs of obvious wear and tear, their faces glowed with radiance. And their expressions lacked the haggardness of most commoners. Old John smiled as he greeted his neighbors. Dragon City was indeed different from the past. The biggest impression that Old John had was that it was a lot cleaner. The streets used to be full of litter and smelled of rot and decay. This was the norm for most cities in San Soliel, and those who lived in the slums had it even worse. Comparatively speaking, nobles' estates were quite pleasant. However, after the great Lord Caracolan became their city lord, his first order was for the citizens to clean up the area a hundred meters around their living spaces. He did not demand that there be no trash, but that it absolutely had to be tidy. He also placed a ban on public defecation and urination outside of assigned spaces. Violators of these laws would be charged light fines, and in more serious cases, would be whipped. The city lord also declared that all commoners must bathe at least once a week. Although the people's daily habits had been restricted by these harsh laws, they were submissive in nature. As long as they could continue living, they would not find it difficult to comply. Moreover, they felt that their lord was quite generous. People who did not comply with his regulations were better off dead. Dragon City did not lack water resources. It was located in the middle of the San Soliel mountain range with an underground river flowing through the city. This was enough to meet the needs of the city. Given the medieval level of social development, frequent bathing was not a social norm. The vast majority of citizens failed to bathe even once a year. This wasn't because they disliked cleaning themselves, but because the rigors of their lives meant they could barely find the time for such luxuries. But under the strict orders of their new lord, everyone began to clean up and organize the work. Some people even joked privately that the lord might be an elf due to his penchant for cleanliness. At first, because they were already used to having filth in their environment, cleaning made little sense to the citizens. Nevertheless, they complied with their lord's instructions. Soon, old John found that the cleanup seemed to have a positive effect on everyone's psyche. At the very least, everyone was in a happier mood when smelling the fresh air instead of feces. During the day, men who could work were called in to do manual labor to rebuild the city, while the women were tasked with cleaning the environment. In other cities, this was an impossible way to divide labor as it would mean half of the population was not producing food. Given the low productivity of each farmer, it was easy to see why this was undesirable. If such a policy was implemented, not only would the population of the territory starve, but the lords would gradually become poorer and lose their territories. But the sacred dragon thought differently. He did not care about the loss of labor, and he made sure that the citizens transformed the city in line with his grand design. He was liberal with the wheat and meat under his control. And for the residents who were mostly used to eating bitter black bread, their present circumstances were almost heavenly. With such clear benefits for complying with his administration, only idiots would choose to slack off. But there were always such people. In fact, old John soon came across them on his way to work. Walking through one of the city squares, he saw a dozen or so people surrounded by soldiers. The prisoners were naked and kneeling on the ground. They wailed and begged for mercy as the infantry cracked whips at them and drew blood with each strike. The soldiers were the remnants of the forces that fled Central City when Louis had attacked. Most of the elite forces had been wiped out by Louis's flames, but a few divisions managed to escape total annihilation. Unfortunately, they were fairly weak compared to their martyred counterparts. Nevertheless, they were familiar with the city. And while they would no longer have any place in the new army, they functioned well enough as overseers of internal order. The current whipping was merely an extension of their duties. Though such means were crass and perhaps even immoral when judged with a 21st century mindset, Louis was not about to change his mind on their use. This was a completely different place and time. If someone tried to explain the concept of human rights to even the lowliest commoner who stood to gain the most from them, they would simply be laughed off like fools. While Louis could be just, stern, and munificent, 
those were simply traits he adopted for his own ends. He did not govern for the sake of the city's residents, but for his and his alone. He would not hesitate to kill those who threatened the order of his territory. And he claimed the right to personally decide on the life and death of each and every citizen. Those saintly protagonists from web novels shouldn't even be alive if their situation was more realistic. They would simply be killed off before their stories got anywhere. Look at them, it's no wonder that they are poor. The Lord is so generous and great. By just investing in labor, we get to enjoy food that only nobles could eat and fill our stomachs. These people actually dared resort to theft and trickery to pretend to work, all in the name of cheating food and drinks out of the Lord. For sure. I used to pity one of them when I saw him in the slums, but now, it seems that such people do not deserve even the slightest bit of it. It's a waste of food to keep them alive. They might as well be killed. Under the curses and malice of the nearby onlookers, the slackers were gradually beaten to death. A soldier walked over to check the slackers' breathing, and seeing that the person was dead, he waved his hands to beckon the other soldiers. They carried the body of the dead slackers outside the city and burned it in a great fire. In this chaotic age, the lands were filled with numerous instances of great warmth and cruelty. The crowd quickly dispersed as they headed to tend to their responsibilities. The entire Dragon City was now buzzing with activity. Major construction sites were set up, and infrastructure was rapidly established. As a transmigrator from Earth, Louis felt that his subjects were easy to dupe. Simply by feeding them some white bread and meat he could gain their devotion and utmost loyalty. It was a perfect source of free labor. Moreover, while they were working, they kept saying praises to Louis. This was simply unimaginable in modern society. Louis clearly knew that the economic foundation was determined by the construction of infrastructure. As long as there was a good foundation, the future of the city would be able to take off like a dragon. He would transform Dragon City into something he was proud of. Please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. Chapter 72 There is no eternity in kingship, only gods are immortal. Dragon City bustled with activity as construction workers dug foundations and laid masonry under the guidance of the elves. In many ways, medieval construction was much simpler than its modern counterpart. For instance, the towers of steel and concrete that stood tall over modern cities would make no appearance here. The highest the artisans of San Soliel could do for ordinary residences were two to three stories. And as the resource requirements were fairly basic, wood and stone, it wasn't difficult to get the ball rolling on simple buildings. Louis had played with the idea of using cement, but ultimately he decided against it. It was revolutionary technology to be sure and would give him an immediate short-term advantage against his competitors, but it was too easy to steal the method for creating it if he didn't do it all by himself. With their larger populations, nations which used cement in their construction would be able to eclipse Dragon City's industrial output. For now, Sansoliel would have to make do with the magical equivalent of cement that was already in use. Louis's intention was to train a group of low-ranked mages and have them use the spell, create cement, to manufacture batches of the substance. He would then use it to pave the roads and build better walls and houses. As other countries would be unable to copy it, he could form a monopoly on it. The layout for the residential area was thus fairly basic for now. As he knew that many more people would join the city later on, he made sure to leave a lot of space for future expansion. As for the area closest to his nest, in other words, the noble district, Louis had carefully planned it out. It needed to be built following the exact details of his plan, so he sent his most efficient people there. Under March's instruction, he began to rebuild the area. All the houses in this city were rebuilt to be two to three stories tall in order to raise the population density. In a few years, after the population rose and Dragon City became the most yearned for on the continent, he would be able to grant accommodations to talented individuals. This way he could by their goodwill and service. The supervisors of the noble district were all elves. These elves were not as strict as human supervisors, but they cared more about the details. But the people who came to work here had been specially chosen from the populace. The elves were not worried that they would slack off. As long as they carefully monitored their work and did not create any hazards, it was enough. As for the people working there, they could also see that large forces of elves had been coming and going. They had ridden horse-like animals to pull carts carrying transport supplies. Even the elven army's hippogriffs were being used to transport supplies. The scene looked extremely busy. Moreover, let alone seeing so many elves, this was the first time many people had ever seen any. These supplies were food that the great dragon promised to give the elves. 
but due to the lack of manpower in Dragon City, the elves had to transport the goods by themselves. There was indeed space-type equipment in this world, but those were mostly legendary rank items, and most of them could only store a small number of items. Furthermore, they were extremely rare and only possessed by powerful mages. On the other hand, those with large storage spaces were classified as divine weapons. Those things were rare to the point of unattainable. If this world was flooded with space-type equipment, then caravans wouldn't be needed anymore. Trade between countries would be much more frequent and developed, preventing the economy of the world from being so backward. So for all races and countries, the delivery of goods still relied on caravans. Rome was not built in a day. It was impossible to finish all construction in Dragon City within a short time period especially when Louis was trying to change the entire city's design. However, he was not in a hurry. Dragons were creatures that could sleep for years let alone a few months. Louis was finally getting used to the fact that his own life expectancy now far exceeded that of humans, and might even become infinite someday. He had to stop himself from using a human perspective to look at time, else he would just be making things painful for himself. Humans were always in a hurry due to their relatively short lifespans, but long-lived races and gods would even use hundreds and thousands of years just to finish one task. Louis was also learning how to spend his time doing worthless activities. There was no eternity in kingship, only gods were immortal. Everything he did right now was for the sake of his future ascension to godhood. All the wealth and power he could accumulate along the way was simply illusory compared to that. As the sun set, the day's work was over. The workers were now sitting on the ground panting, resting, and laughing among themselves. Although the work was exhausting, excitement remained in their expressions. This was because happiness was about to come. Their lord was going to distribute the day's pay refined wheat and some meat. Louis understood human nature quite well. If you helped people too much, they would become dependent on your aid. And if you then took it away, then they would definitely hate you. So the food Louis distributed to each family was counted by head. This way, they could eat their fill but not have much food left over. He could increase the reward by a little for those who worked harder, as this was the best way to spur them into action. Even if the food Louis had was blown in by a storm and there were no problems giving everyone a ton of goods, once he did so, other than gaining the gratitude of these commoners, he wouldn't gain anything else. It would not take long for them to become greedier and lazier. So, giving them proper rewards and decreasing the pay was important. Everyone line up for your pay, an elf shouted. People began to quietly and neatly arrange themselves in a queue. Those who cut in line to disrupt the previous days had been brought to the square and whipped. As a result, no one dared to make trouble this time. John. Old John heard someone call him, and it was an elven soldier. He hastily bent over and let out his best smile while feeling apprehensive at the approaching elf. This male elf frowned at the human in front of him but soon relaxed. The humans were now not as smelly as before. Although they were still a little dirty, the elves could accept this level of cleanliness when he compared it with other cities out there. You have been working very hard recently and even relied on your own knowledge to lead others to do a better job. The great Lord Galakrond knows how to punish and reward people. Under his instructions, this will be the reward for your contribution. Saying so, the elf handed over a wooden box, but he was showing off an envious look. Old John was apprehensive and afraid that he had done something wrong, but after hearing the elf's words, his expression changed to happiness. He kneeled down as if he was receiving the emperor's edict and carefully accepted the wooden box. He glanced at the elf and opened it at the other party's gesture. Oh God! Old John exclaimed. He stared incredulously at the item inside the box. It was a fork. Ornate and gleaming with a metallic sheen, it seemed to be a work of art. It had an exquisite appearance, smooth without any rough edges, and precise to the millimeter. No one doubted that it was an item that could only be made by a dwarven master craftsman. Of course, modern assembly line production could easily reach such levels of accuracy. Louis had taken the fork when he looted the freighter. Perhaps its original owner was one of the crew members. Louis, however, had no use for it and felt disgusted at the thought that it might have been used before, so he simply used it as a reward for excellent behavior. The elven soldier also looked at the fork with envy. Although the pattern was not in line with the elves' sense of beauty, the sophisticated square arrangements on it implied that they were crafted with great skill. Only the elven nobles would have access to such a fine piece of art. Now, this fork was given to a human commoner. This made the elves on sight extremely jealous to the point that they wanted to roll up their sleeves and go move some bricks. The Lord has said that the fork is endowed with magic. 
it will not rust, so you must keep it well. Please rest assured that I will love it like my child and treat it as a family heirloom so that my descendants will never forget the gift of the great lord. Oh God, it's an enchanted cutlery fork, and it won't rust. Old John almost fainted in excitement. If Louis was in front of him, he might just kneel down and worship. The fork would indeed not rust, because it was made of stainless steel. Chapter 73 The dragon is above, and the gods are below. Old John was extremely elated. In this age of scarcity, cutlery was a pointless luxury for most. Their use was restricted to the tables of nobles and royalty. And even in those cases, some of their poorer members would share their silverware. For the commoners, however, their hands would more than suffice for their meals. Although black bread was coarse, difficult to eat, and at times mixed with sawdust, it was quite nutritious. And people could rely on it to fill the bulk of their dietary needs. Moreover, for some strange reason, the inhabitants of San Solio could generally expect to live to sixty years old if they didn't pass away violently. The dwarves of San Solio possessed impressive skills when it came to crafting metal equipment. But even among them, only the most talented would pay attention to the aesthetics of their creations. Most focused on enhancing the quality of the materials they worked with and bestowing magical attributes to the end results. Thus, delicate tableware of the kind that old John received was something that few would bother to spend time crafting. Consequently, fine cutlery was worth more than its weight in gold. Earth's industrialized economies, however, had mastered the art of mass production. By standardizing production, they could match the skill of the dwarves on a consistent basis. By giving away the fork, Louis was basically throwing away a luxury that only the highest class of nobles could enjoy. My dears, look at what I have brought back. Old John returned home and first put the bags of flour and meat on the table. Then he called over his wife and children. He carefully put the wooden box on the table and opened it. Oh, gods, this is a dinner fork? Such a fine dinner fork. John, tell me honestly, where did you get it? John's wife covered his mouth. She was excited at first but soon revealed a frightened look. She was afraid that John had gone through illegal means to get it. Although their new lord was extremely generous, his punishments were equally harsh. In Dragon City, any crime was subject to severe punishment. These were often corporal in nature and involved some element of torture. In fact, as the level of medical knowledge was quite low, a good whipping could often be the death of an unlucky convict. Don't get too excited, dear. This is a special reward from the Lord for all my hard work. It is an item enchanted by a great mage, and it will not rust. Old John said smugly. Lord God above. The Lord actually granted such a precious item to us? John's wife's eyes were red. She trembled and caressed the stainless steel fork, which was worth more than her own family in her opinion, with her rough fingers. Sure. Silence. Old John spoke with a stern expression. Although the Lord did not explicitly say it, many of us have held private discussions. This territory formerly belonged to the theocracy, but now it's already in the hands of the Honorable City Lord. In the future, do not recklessly speak of God. For unknown reasons, the gods had not shown their miracles for a long time. Although devout priests were still able to obtain their blessings, most humans could no longer communicate with them. Therefore not everyone had faith in the gods. Perhaps when the gods were able to finally influence the continent again, a new battle of faith will occur. John's wife quickly covered her mouth and whispered, Then what should I say? Say, the great dragon watches. John said seriously. Yes, the great dragon watches. This novel is available on Hosted Novel. The couple bowed their heads in reverence. Recently, the people of Dragon City felt as though they were in heaven. Their hard work was properly rewarded and they went to sleep with full stomachs. For the ordinary people of this era, this was simply a luxury, their greatest desire. Their impression of the dragon had slowly turned from fear to respect and allegiance. If the theocracy were to take back the city at this moment, these commoners would resist with all their might. Dad, Dad. Let us touch it too. Can we? Old John saw the look of longing in the eyes of his son and daughter. He hesitated for a moment before saying, Okay. I'll let you touch it. From now on, this is our family heirloom. You must always remember the greatness and generosity of the Lord and preserve this fork, okay? We understand, Dad. Old John was very happy to see his children behaving so well. At dinner time, old John and his family sat around an old wooden table. Good quality white bread and a few thin slices of meat were served. Old John carefully tore the bread and held onto the stainless steel fork. 
With a clumsy reverence, he picked up the bread with the fork and placed it into his mouth. He handed the fork to his wife who did the same before passing it on to their children. Old John had seen the nobles eat like this. The only difference was that they had dinner plates and other items, but the forks they had used were definitely not as exquisite and beautiful as the ones given to them by the Lord. At this moment, old John truly felt that life was worth living. He could actually experience what it was like to be a nobleman. The dinner was interrupted by a series of loud knocks from the front door. Old John stood at alert, and his wife put away the fork. The couple feared that someone coveting the tableware had come to steal it from them. He carefully picked up a loaf of black bread from the table and crept towards the door. If the person in front was a suspicious character, he would instantly bonk them on the head with it. Reaching the door, he opened it with a single violent motion but was stunned when he saw all of his neighbors waiting outside. Hey, old John? I heard you got a reward from the great lord? They say that the hardest workers were given gifts today. The boy two blocks away who used to work with me got a dinner plate from the lord. It's really enviable. My brother's wife's cousin. The second aunt of my great uncle's next door neighbor. His front porch was alive with all sorts of conversations. Old John finally understood that he was not the only person who had been rewarded. Other residents were also rewarded with a variety of things, and not just dinner forks. He immediately became more enthusiastic and motivated. If he worked hard and showed more of his hard work, maybe one day, they could be rewarded with a full set of tableware. That. Old John, can you let us touch it, the fork? Someone rubbed his hands and asked carefully. All of them looked at him hopefully. Such a scene happened in many corners of Dragon City. At the capital of the Silver Moon Kingdom, Cisna and a large number of elves had finally arrived. After a long journey, they had finally delivered the food safely. Chapter 74 Bricklaying is the most sought-after job. Thousands of hippogriffs soared through the sky, the flap of their wings kicking up strong winds in their wake. Beneath them, horse-like beasts of burden dragged carriages laden with rations to the forest. As they neared the woods, the trees seemed to part slightly, as though making a pathway for them. After the caravan passed by, the trees moved back into their original positions, closing the path and erecting a barrier for the Silver Moon Kingdom. The Silver Moon Kingdom had about a million elves, and practically no elves on the main continent lived outside its fold. It was as large as the largest human empire. These treant protectors had been guarding the front lines of the Silver Moon Kingdom for thousands of years. With their forest network, they could create the most suitable environment for elves to fight in. Even if tens of thousands of troops were to invade, the labyrinth they built would call them in droves. In addition to the huge magic barrier that protected the elven city for thousands of years, the queen of the elves was also a demigod. Even if other demigods were to invade, they would only be able to take a single step forward before falling into danger. The current state of affairs took millennia of effort given their birth rate challenges. After entering the Silver Moon Kingdom's borders, Cisna saw a bird fly through the fragrant air. Before her lay a dense network of tree branches that hoisted greenwood houses. Palm-sized fairies flew among the flowers. Fawns looked curiously at the large contingent of elves without saying a word and rushed towards the center of the kingdom. On top of the tall trees in the distance, a group of druids who had transformed into munkins bowed towards Cisna and then continued to inspect the magical barriers of the kingdom. The sprites and dryads seemed to be startled. They timidly looked at the happy expressions on the elves driving the carriage. The Silver Moon Kingdom was not only the land of the elves but also a gathering of many races that loved nature and freedom. They had also been living here in peace for many years. The blue sky and white clouds, the clear streams and springs, the towering trees and vibrant flora, the rainbow and treehouses might make the Silver Moon Kingdom look like it came out of a fairy tale, but it was not as beautiful as it seemed. Poverty and hunger were also existent in this place and were difficult to solve. Even some countries in the 1960s still experienced famine. For an unproductive race like the elves, it was already incredible that they hadn't gone extinct. Cisna took a deep breath. She felt the natural and peaceful atmosphere of the Silver Moon Kingdom quickly calm her mind. She then directed the hippogriff beneath her to fly towards the royal palace. When she arrived at the ancient Tree of Life, Cisna's expression became humble. She walked up the rainbow bridge leading to the palace. Under the lead of the maids, she entered the palace and once again had an audience with the elven queen. I know the purpose of your arrival. You've done well, Cisna. You have brought enough rations for us to get through the winter. Karandia's voice rang out. Despite her praise, however, there was a slight edge of helplessness to her tone. 
The forest of the moon was located in the south of the continent. While it could avoid the worst of the winter cold, food was still difficult to find during this period, and starvation was rampant. With the dragon's boon, this year would definitely be a comparatively better one. The elves could not increase their population easily. And although they had many strengths as a race, they had just as many weaknesses. And so they had not been that successful in the recent wars against humans. This time, the queen was pleasantly surprised yet anxious at the refined wheat that Cisna brought. Because elves lived long lives, even the most common elf occasionally indulged in pleasures as human nobles did. However, when there was nothing else to eat and they were starving, they would have to eat black bread like everyone else. But if they were allowed to eat the white bread baked from this refined wheat, then the next time, they might rather starve to death than go back to eating black bread. Elves were a hard-to-please race, so the queen decided to use the refined wheat to exchange for more coarse grains from human society. It was better to use quantity to meet the needs of the race. This is what I should do, your majesty. As a member of the elves, I should give my efforts for the growth of the race. Cisna kneeled down on one knee and performed the ancient elven salute. She lowered her head as much as possible to not meet the gaze of the queen. Because of the queen's immeasurable transcendent charm, even a legendary rank ranger like her would sometimes be captivated even if she had been with the queen since childhood. Her mind would fall into a trance and feel ecstasy. Find the original at hosted novel. The queen's beauty had already reached the level of a curse. Are our people getting used to life in Dragon City? She had sent thousands of elven soldiers and even noble elven maidens to Dragon City. Even if she understood that this was the right thing to do politically, she still felt guilt at such betrayal to her fellow elves. That, Cisna was hesitant. Are they not having trouble living there? The queen sighed softly. The nearby trees and flowers seemed to wither with her mood. She knew that elves were uncomfortable with life outside the forest. No, our people are not too resistant to living in Dragon City. The city is now neat and clean under the lead of Lord Caracolan. Although it's not as good as Silver Moon City, the people have already adapted. Cisna could only say it like this, and it wasn't really a lie. She could not just say everything to the Honorable Queen. It was impossible for her to tell her that her people were now happily eating and drinking in Dragon City as compared to the Silver Moon Kingdom. The Dragon Lord disliked keeping fruits as they went bad easily. Other than eating some of them, the rest was rewarded to the elves. Although the fruits had some differences from the fruits inside the Forest of the Moon, they were indeed fruits, sweet, delicious, fresh, and juicy. They were also able to enjoy white bread and exquisite meat, which was unlike the chaff and water in Silver Moon City. Other than elven officers, who got to enjoy white bread from time to time, ordinary soldiers never even had the chance to taste such fluffy cuisine. The elves were not a productive race, and even among humans, only great nobles were able to enjoy such food at all times. It was simply impossible for ordinary soldiers to enjoy it. If the queen were to visit Dragon City now, she might just faint. Those handsome male elven soldiers had lifted up their sleeves and were laying bricks. A few druids had even changed into their bare forms and were moving heavy slabs of stone. The city lord was very pleased with all this and rewarded them with gourmet food that Cisna had never seen or heard before, as well as exquisite and delicate utensils. Metal was not rare, and the pattern was barely accepted by them but the light and smooth beauty that could not be made by an ordinary craftsman was simply a work of art. Now, bricklaying was the most sought-after job in the entire Dragon City. There had even been conflicts between humans and elves, as the humans felt that the elves had stolen their bricklaying work. Please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. Chapter 75 The Legend of the Elven Princess and the Dragon King Your Highness, Lord Caracolan Cisna told the elven queen everything that happened in Dragon City. She even told her of the declaration that Louis informed marches to make on his behalf. Up to 200,000 tons of refined wheat. Although the elven queen's face was covered in perpetual fog, Cisna could also guess that her queen was very astonished. Search hosted novel for the original. That's 200,000 tons of refined wheat. Even if all the human kingdoms banded together, they would not be able to produce that much. If he can freely let his citizens enjoy such grains and gift them to us in such large quantities, then perhaps it's not that he doesn't know their value, but that he can easily obtain as much as he wants. Can we obtain more of it? Where did Lord Caracolan get it? Cisna asked in shock. Perhaps he found a realm that can produce food in abundance. No, that shouldn't be. If there really was such a realm, then why don't others know about it? Cisna stammered and asked. 
She had this kind of speculation before but felt that it was a bit illogical, so she did not dare make such a judgment. If there really was a realm full of food, then the entire world would undergo a huge change. The sea of stars is so vast. Even the gods cannot fully understand it. In addition to the famous realms, there are countless unknown realms that haven't been discovered. Even those well-known ones haven't been fully explored. Moreover, outside the crystal wall system, there are extraterrestrial organisms that exist. And those existences. As she continued, Karandia suddenly became silent, as if she finally noticed that she could not just blurt these words out and closed her mouth. Although Cisna was still somewhat curious about the so-called crystal wall system, she knew that she should not ask since the queen had fallen silent. No matter what happens, whether Lord Caracolan found a realm that produced food or other reasons, as a demigod, no one can peer into his secrets, not even the gods. If a demigod is unwilling, their secrets would forever remain a secret. But the strange items described by your words make the possibility of him finding an unknown realm very high. Moreover, that realm has a fairly developed civilization. After saying this, Karandia hesitated. This was because the main continent was already the center of the multiverse. The upper realm was where gods were located, while the lower realm, known as Abyss, was where demons were located. Although civilization in the main continent seemed to be underdeveloped, it was in fact the most developed in accordance with the theory of civilization. Under normal circumstances, there should be no other realm that was more developed than the main continent. But Karandia would never imagine that Earth was not in their crystal wall system at all, but a different universe altogether. This world's gods did not have the ability to travel to another universe, and Louis didn't rely on magic to do so. Realizing that it was an unsolvable mystery, Karandia chose to stop thinking about it. As she had said, if a demigod wanted to hide a secret, even true gods would not be able to find out. Their prestige was nothing to scoff at. As for Lord Karakolan transforming Dragon City into a trade center, it seems his political acumen is quite impressive. By doing so he can defuse any hostility with the humans and beast men and warn us not to try using him. Karandia laughed helplessly and sighed again. How could that be? Cisna whispered. She had always felt that the elves and the mighty dragon had a good relationship. If they didn't then why would he give the elves so much food? The elven queen gently patted Cisna's shoulder and said in a warm voice, Elves are too arrogant. Cisna, you are also quite arrogant. You respect Lord Caracolan's power, but you don't respect his identity as a dragon. You and many people still carry disdain within you and think that dragons don't understand politics. You don't even care about the favorite means used by humans. Your Majesty, I. Cisna bowed her head deeply. A touch of shame flashed across her tough and stubborn yet pretty face. You need to exhibit the proper attitude, Cisna Susserl. Remember that your surname is the same as mine, which in the old elvish language means favorite of the moon. Lady Silver Moon will always be watching you. She continued, I raised you from childhood and treated you as my own daughter. You are now my other half and have not failed me. Four hundred years ago, you also stepped into the legendary rank. Although you are a ranger general, the elves have always treated you as their princess, and you cannot fail them. Put down your arrogance. You have to treat Lord Karakolan as one of those conniving human politicians. You should also be careful of him and not be deceived by his flowery words. His wisdom is as deep as the abyss. He is not someone who would be impressed by words alone. Karandia's words made Cisna feel ashamed. Her delicate pretty face reddened. The queen's words made her realize that she had really thought of Lord Karakolan as an ordinary dragon, thought that the elves could easily influence his thoughts by just following the normal routine and thought that they could easily turn him into their gatekeeper. It seemed that she made things out to be too simple. In fact, the elves and the Lord Dragon were more like allies, providing assistance to each other. If one side lost their eligibility to be allies, then the relationship would change immediately. Lord Karakolan is also considered as an outlier among dragons. His political awareness reminds me of the Queen of the Dragon Kingdom. Karandia shook her head slightly. The Queen of the Dragon Kingdom? Isn't that a human? Cisna asked in confusion. This was the common knowledge of the main continent. The Dragon Kingdom signed a covenant with the Dragon Race. The Dragon became the protectors and nominal owners of the kingdom, while the royal family of the country only had the right to manage the humans and other races within the kingdom. This is one of the secrets of the main continent. Only a few people know that there is no such thing as a royal family in the Dragon Kingdom. 
From its establishment, the Dragon Kingdom has been ruled by a silver dragon known as the Mithril King. She is also an ancient dragon, and one of the few in their race that could be called the Dragon King. She has been ruling the kingdom as a human, and she serves as the queen of each generation. Cisna opened her mouth wide. She did not expect that there was such a secret in the far northeast Dragon Kingdom. These dragons were really outliers. One of them actually learned to be the ruler of a kingdom for thousands of years and actually governed it well. Karandia chuckled at Cisna's surprised astonishment and said, Go check the storage for the food, Cisna. This food is important to us elves. Let some of the people bring a portion to the human kingdom and replace them with more common wheat. Yes, your majesty. Cisna respectfully saluted and left the royal palace. When Cisna went away, Karandia sat down on her wooden throne woven with rotten wood and picked up a strange bag on the table. Inside it was the bread filled with chocolate sauce that Cisna had gotten from Louis. The queen's jade-like fingers easily tore open the bag and tore a piece of the bread. She gazed down at the brownish-black chocolate sauce and brought it to her lips. Only after a long time did she let out what seemed to be a moving sigh. Thirty thousand years. It's already been thirty thousand years since I've enjoyed such delicious food. Behind Karandia, a silver moon rose. At the center of the silver moon, what seemed like a faraway kingdom could be seen. Thirty thousand years, and you are also about to open your eyes. TL Note, Crystal Wall System is like the Solar System. You get the idea. The you in the last sentence is plural. Chapter 76 Elf Candy Dragon City, The Dragon's Nest Louis lay in the center of a blooming garden, enjoying the warm sunlight. A dozen beautiful elven maids were diligently tending to his needs. Some sprayed his scales with sparkling water and rubbed them with soft cloths. Others stayed by his mouth and cleaned his teeth with large brushes. At present, he was focusing on a small book in front of him. This was a book of spells that Marches had lent him. Within it were the details of spellcasting, from the level of parlor tricks to sixth-rank magic. After learning of its convenience on Earth, Louis was determined to raise his skill. It would make fooling Earthlings a lot easier in the future. However, magic was really obscure and difficult to understand. Learning magic from scratch made Louis feel a headache. It wasn't difficult for him to learn spells from the first rank to the third rank. By virtue, dragons had a high affinity for magic and learned quickly. But starting from the fourth rank spells, there were many requirements to cast them. They were so complex that Louis felt like he was looking at advanced mathematics. He now realized why there were so few mages in this world. This was not something normal humans could learn. Find the original at hosted novel. Forget it. I shouldn't be too anxious, let's take this slowly. Louis shook his head and was not too worried about the situation. Magic was only a stopgap measure in the end. If he really wanted to become stronger, he needed to find the energy sources on Earth and bring them back to San Soliel so that he could evolve. His road to greater strength was not that difficult. But convincing the people of Earth to believe in the supernatural would greatly help him find the energy sources. This was why learning magic became fairly important. This is so troublesome. It's like I've become a student again. Louis had found three paths that he had to progress along at the same time. The first path was to find the energy sources on Earth. As long as he brought them back to San Soliel, he could quickly reach his perfect form and gain the divine power of the gods. He wouldn't even need to fear Earth's military anymore. The second path was to master a divine domain, understand the secrets of the gods, and use faith to make himself a god of this world. As long as he could become a god, then he could stand on the same stage as them. At that time, with the power of a god combined with the power of his evolution, he wouldn't need to fear them. As long as he reached the ends of these two roads, he would become the strongest on earth and in San Soliel. As for what happened after, there was no point in making predictions. Finally, Louis needed to master the power of magic. It was, after all, more convenient than divine power. The path to becoming a god was not really restricted to learning spells. Gods and job holders are two entirely different systems. Some gods may be warriors, thieves, or rangers by profession. Not all gods were mages and could use magic. Unless. Unless I obtain a divine authority related to magic. It doesn't have to be a full authority. Even a small fragment would help me learn spells. Louis felt a headache. Wanting to obtain a specific divine authority was too hard, but not impossible. For example, the godhood inside his soul was from the dragon god. The godhood had already lost the concept of domain formerly held by the dragon god, but if Louis used it well, he might be able to perform many miracles. 
I should find some time to test the godhood, I should also learn how to use my treasures. There isn't much divine power remaining in the godhood, but it is still very useful. If my own guess about the gods is correct, then I might be able to quickly learn magic. Louis pondered. These past few days, Louis had been able to feel the beliefs of the residents of the city. He had not created his own religion, but the people of the city had already taken the initiative to pray to him. Although these beliefs were not as firm as general faith, with a bit more guidance, he could cultivate them into true believers. This was the power of the sugar-coated shells of capitalism, and his intended method from the beginning. It was a pity that he was a dragon with just a godhood, but not a real god, so he couldn't efficiently convert the faith into divine power. The road to becoming a god was already difficult. Countless blessed children in this world used up to thousands of years, yet were unable to succeed. Those that had tried to reach the gods were countless. Louis already had the godhood of one of the former highest gods. His path to becoming a god was already a lot easier compared to normal people. After learning for an entire afternoon, he felt quite tired and looked to the side. The elven noble maiden standing at the side blushed. In an instant, she knew what Louis was intending to do. With an embarrassed face, she lowered her head and lightly pinched her clothes. Her heart thumped loudly and complained in her heart that her lord was always bullying her. But in the recent period of time, Louis's teaching already made her able to endure it. Two other maids quickly poured some kind of juice that was a mix of honey and herbs on her body. The honey and herbs were the specialties of the elves. For the human nobility, these were luxury goods that elves used to exchange with the humans. It didn't take long for the elf's body to be coated with honey and herbs, emitting a sweet fragrance, as if she was a human-shaped candy. This was the dragon's afternoon dessert. Louis felt that being a lord of a city in another world was truly great, especially in one as racially colorful as this world. Chapter 77, Patrolling the Territory A babbling stream coursed through the palace garden. Within it, the noble elven maidens washed their bodies, they lifted water from the stream up with wooden ladles before dousing themselves with the clear liquid. Each drop carried within it flecks of their aromatic essence. Prior to this, their entire bodies had been covered with honey, and so they needed to cleanse themselves to feel comfortable once more. They whispered among themselves, occasionally casting glances in Louis's direction. None dared to meet his gaze, however. And soon, their voices rose in volume as a playful atmosphere overtook them. Initially, some had thought to refuse Louis's orders if they went too far. But none of them truly had the guts to do so. After all, they hadn't the right to refuse his orders given their statuses. That said, Louis did not go out of his way to scare them in any way. And so all their fear was self-generated. Louis rose up and stretched his neck. He spread his wings and took to the skies in a tour of his territory. Recently he would do this on occasion to manifest his presence. He couldn't do it every day as it would form a pattern. Once he left for earth for a longer period of time, his enemies would be able to tell when he wasn't present. At that time, disaster would strike Dragon City. The time interval between his patrols also couldn't be too long either. Otherwise, it would make the residents forget that he, the city lord, existed and become detrimental to his rule. His giant body flew to the skies. Compared to his initial identity as an enemy of the city, his current body was now a lot smaller. At that time, he was a demigod with a body over 300 meters long. Another change was that the people of the city no longer feared him. When they saw him in the skies, they would salute him from the bottom of their hearts, some would even kneel down and pray to his figure. By satisfying their materialistic desire, Louis had obtained their reverence. He believed that over time, he would also be able to obtain their heartfelt admiration. That would prove to be a source of substantial faith. These 100,000 people were the foundation of his believers. Dragon City was not large. It was equivalent to a small country town. In truth, there weren't many especially large cities in the world of San Soleil. The largest on the continent was the capital of the empire with an estimated population of 1 million. This was the limit of the era. Cities with populations of more than 10 million did not exist in San Soliel. A city of 10 million would consume an astronomical amount of resources every day, and no force would be able to support that high a population. Even cities in northern China would require the entire country to supply it. Given their relatively low level of logistical development, such megacities were infeasible for all. Louis's goal was to keep Dragon City's population below 500,000. If it exceeded that, Dragon City could actually weaken as internal forces vied for power. 
Under the eyes of the people, Louis quickly finished his patrol. The buildings in the city had mostly been built. With the resources and food that Louis provided, everyone worked together to build a normal residential district. The once dirty streets had become much cleaner. At the very least, they had fulfilled Louis's minimum requirements. New houses had also been erected for those who had lost them in the fire. The noble district was a bit slower because of its more detailed requirements. But Louis was not in a hurry, because the first people living there were elves and humans who had major contributions to the project. There weren't many of them. Dragon City is backed by the San Soliel mountain range. It's rich in minerals, forests, water sources, and fertile arable land. These are enough to meet the needs of the city, but because it is inland instead of by the sea, salt is a bigger necessity. Louis was now more and more like a lord. He even treated this as a simulation game. It's just that there was no system to tell him what to do like a game and had to think of everything himself. Salt shouldn't be a problem. Earth's salt reserves are enough to meet the needs of billions of people. I should find some way to bring some salt over next time. Earth never lacked natural resources. But because salt was a necessity, the ruling class used to control it in their hands as a means of domination. March's research is almost done. Based on his research, I have to decide if I will bring more wasabi or not. But I can't leave Dragon City before it stabilizes. I also have to find a way to get stronger. Looking for wasabi and salt is not as easy as randomly looting a cargo ship, since cargo ships would only carry a small amount of these items. I may need to find a representative on Earth to help me do these things, but that means I also have to move on land. Louis leaked out a human-like expression. How was he going to move on land without being noticed by anyone? How was he going to be able to control more of Earth's resources? These were tests for him. Since he created Cthulhu on Earth, he had to double down on his deceit. He needed to make the people of Earth believe that Earth was dangerous and that many terrible monsters and evil gods exist. Only when his strength truly reached the level of the great old ones would he be able to turn the lie into a reality. I also have to plan how to develop Dragon City. Since I'm limiting the population inside the city to 500,000, the food there should be enough to satisfy 500,000 people. It seems that I have to let the residents raise cattle and sheep instead of farming. That way I can have them make more cows, milk, meat, wool, nectar, and other luxuries of the era. Only in this way can my city become the morning star of civilization. I should also establish my own financial system. Moreover, as long as I have a monopoly on food channels, no one in Dragon City would betray me. Betraying me would simply mean the demise of the entire city. Louis let out a pleasant laugh. He found himself thinking of ways to centralize his authority. Ah, there's still a lot of work to be done. Dragon City should also have its own army. Well, let's just take it step by step. I should first enjoy my time more. This novel is available on Hosted Novel. Thinking of those beautiful elven maids, Louis was reluctant to leave. He originally thought that anime and cartoons were just lies, but when he became a dragon, he found that he was not deceived. There were some things that humans simply could not do, but a dragon can. The strongest people in the world would often have their nicknames. And so he decided to call himself the Black Beast King. Chapter 78, Reconstruction Complete The great dragon city lord, the self-proclaimed Black Beast King Louis, had returned to his lair at the peak of Dragon City. The city itself was constructed upon a mountain, with the center of the city at its peak and the remainder built upon the downward slopes. At the peak was naturally the Lord's residence, which was now Louis's lair. His residence was the palatial church that the theocracy had constructed over its 300-year administration of the territory. Below the Lord's residence was the noble district, but it was largely devoid of any of the original nobles as most of them had run away during the siege. A small part of those that remained had been killed under Louis's orders. They had irritated him with their clamor over their heritage and history within the city. He had promptly declared all of their past accomplishments and rights as moot within his new administration. According to his plans, the future nobles' district would be populated by talented individuals as well as their families. Although he would not confer upon them de jure nobility, in the future, they would certainly form a new caste of aristocrats. As he had never been oppressed by nobility before, he held no strong feelings about their past actions. Nevertheless, he despised the cycle of oppression such a system generated. Even commoners who had once suffered under the yoke of aristocrats would become torturers themselves after being granted superior positions. Well, that would be a matter for the future, and he might not be around to witness it anyways. It was very possible that he would have ascended by then. 
It was not like he could convince them about the merits of democracy anyways. In this world, the average level of intelligence was quite low, and they wouldn't understand why it was a better system. Below the noble district was the largest district, the civilian district. Gazing upon the neatly organized rows of buildings, the squarish area contained residences, market spaces, town squares, and offices. In the future, it would contain entertainment hubs. It was a far cry from its initial filthy and chaotic state. Now that the construction had finished, all Louis had left to do was wait. It would not be long before the city would truly begin to thrive. Louis landed in front of the church and stepped through its gates. In order to show the greatness of the gods, the theocracy had crafted large and magnificent doors. This was quite convenient for Louis given his size. Hanging over the wide hallways within were multicolored beads and golden strips. The path was illuminated by soft candlelight, and various oil paintings decorated the walls. Each depicted some mythical story or legend. In time Louis would replace them with renditions of his own great undertakings. In the chapel, many human girls, diligent and nimble, were busying themselves. They were originally commoners' daughters. As the church was too big for just a dozen elven maids to clean, they assigned the elves to the inner chambers while the humans worked in the outer ones. Because they were only commoners, their etiquette and skills were mediocre. After being intimately familiar with the beautiful elven maids, Louis didn't find them particularly interesting. Anyways, they only needed to work diligently. In the vicinity of these maids were some members of the church. These people were captives that were originally members of the theocracy's priests. Louis captured them and did not kill them. That was because they knew how to use holy magic to heal ordinary injuries and illnesses. They were a lot better than doctors who did not know much. As a result, they were kept to render their services to Dragon City. Additionally, because they were members of the church, they knew how to maintain the luxurious buildings and interior. Keeping them to command the maids would increase the efficiency. It was also fortunate that the gods hadn't revealed themselves for a long time. Otherwise, a few might have declared a crusade against him for daring to use their captured priests. Support us at Hosted Novel. In some ways, it was the theocracy's fault. Their administration had a dislike for mages, who believed in the god of magic, and so had discriminated against them. Thus very few mages lived in Central City to start with. And when Louis burnt half of the city to ashes, most of them were killed. Perhaps it would have been better to capture them and have them serve the city. Seeing that the great lord had arrived, the priests cowered and hurriedly saluted. The maids who were working were at a loss and they just followed their motions. Louis was lucky that the remaining priests were of insignificant rank. Had they been prominent and well-regarded clergymen, catching them would have been useless, as none would serve him. That would, after all, be a betrayal of their covenant with their god. So even if Louis tried to force them, it would be pointless. The closer a priest was to their gods, the stronger they would become. Furthermore, they could not allow their faith to waver. The stronger priests would receive much harsher backlashes for breaking their covenants than the weaker ones. With a magnanimous air, Louis nodded at the servants and turned to his heap of gold coins. The priests were quite relieved. At first, they felt trepidation over serving the dragon, fearing that it would cook them one day. Fortunately, it seemed much more intelligent than its kin. Furthermore, it was much more involved and effective than most human rulers. Even they could not help but doubt its race. Louis lay on the gold mountain with nothing behind him. Louis was thinking of building a huge statue of himself there in the future. It would replace one of the goddesses that the intelligent brain had used for the permanent positioning device. Master! Master! Good news! Good news! Just as he was formulating his next plans for Earth, March's joyful shouts interrupted him. Chapter 79 Successfully Creating Magic Potions The Beastman's Arrival Master! Master! Good news! Good news! Marches stumbled into the hall in an excited mess. He quickly straightened his disordered robes before continuing towards Louis. Louis eyed the panting mage curiously, why the excitement, marches? Mages were traditionally quite level-headed. And even when Louis had caught him filling his pockets with valuables, the old sorcerer had managed to come up with a suitable response on the spot, preserving his own life. Marches hurriedly walked up to his lord while keeping his gaze towards the ground. He began Master, I have finished refining the Louis essence and have obtained the magic origin element inside. This novel is available on Hosted Novel. Saying so, he pulled out a small crystal vial. At this, Louis was shown another instance of the heavy expenses associated with magecraft. 
for just a simple magic potion they would need to use expensive crystal bottles. He thought about it briefly, but could not come up with any reason why the container needed to be crystal. Was it its transparency? Or perhaps it was its ability to contain volatile substances? If it was the former then he might have another leg up over the inhabitants of San Soliel. The inhabitants of San Soliel had invented glass long ago. However, the finished product was often very cloudy and couldn't match the clarity of modern glassware. Its use was often restricted to crafting stained glass windows. Louis looked at the crystal bottle in March's hands. It was small, about as large as a small perfume bottle. Within it lay a dark green-colored liquid reminiscent of wasabi. If it was actually wasabi-flavored, it would be very difficult to drink. Is this the magic origin element? Louis asked in a deep voice. Yes, master. This is the magic origin element that I extracted from the plant you provided. Save those with innate racial magic abilities and freak geniuses, most people need to drink this potion to be able to use magic. Until one reaches the fourth rank and fully adapts to magic, they will need to drink this on occasion. March's was ecstatic, the experiment was a success. The refining process is not difficult. As long as there is a large amount of raw materials, I can produce it at a constant pace. Louis gazed at the small crystal bottle. He knew that the liquid inside was also the so-called mage's currency. It was much more expensive than gold and was something that mages would need to use throughout their lives. Is refining the magic potion the good news that you are talking about? No, great master. Other than successfully refining the medicine, I have also performed some large magical experiments on Louis's essence. Praise the great and supreme dragon. Those plants, those plants can't be grown on the main continent at all. March's next sentences were a little incoherent, but his enthusiasm was clear for all to see. Louis was also excited and unconsciously revealed a hint of joy. This was indeed good news. If wasabi could not grow in this world, Louis would not have to worry about it propagating. Perhaps because of special energy fluctuations, some of earth plants could not grow in San Soliel. By and large earth's botanical composition was radically different from this world's. But no matter what the reason was, this was amazingly good news for Louis. The obvious benefit to him was that he would have a complete monopoly on the magic origin element. With Earth's abundant resources, he would be able to gain a steady supply of it to raise a large number of mages. His dream was slowly inching towards reality. With enough magic users his city would transform significantly. When I return to Earth, I should bring back more wasabi. Well done, marches. Louis raised his head and complimented the old mage. Marches suppressed the excitement and joy in his heart and tried to act humble by saying, this is all due to master's grace. It has nothing to do with me. Ha ha ha. I am a just lord. Since you have made a contribution, I will naturally reward you. Marches. Yes, my great master. Next, I will provide you with a large number of raw materials. You need to turn them into magic potions. A portion of it would be yours to keep. Then I want you to use the magic potions to train enough mages, so that they can become your assistants. Have them assist you in manufacturing magic potions. Of course, you can still enjoy a portion of their labor. Do you understand? This was equivalent to him opening a company. Louis would become the largest stockholder and the main financier, while Marches, who would own a smaller portion, would be in charge of day-to-day -day operations and management. As long as Louis provided enough raw materials, he could stay completely hands-off. He was the only one who could procure the raw materials, and he could just leave everything else to others. Marches was not stupid. With just a bit of thinking, he could tell that this would bring great benefits to him in the future. Although he would be tired at first from manufacturing potions and training mages, as long as he finished training the first batch of mages, he could just let them do all the work later while he supervised the line. He would then be able to obtain the magic element without doing much. With wealth, Marches would be able to exchange a large number of magical materials for his own needs. With such a large amount of money, Marches felt that even pigs could become mages, let alone a talented person like him. Moreover, the path to reaching legendary rank would no longer be a dead end, but a spacious road. O oh great and supreme lord, I, Marches, swear that I would be your eternal humble servant. Let me be in your service forever. Although he had already signed a master-slave contract, he still swore an oath to display his loyalty. Marches kneeled on the ground and prostrated in admiration. He was so excited that he almost shed tears as though his very body and soul were subservient. Louis nodded with satisfaction. He was now the founder of the exploiting class. 
Later, he would become a capitalist who would squeeze every drop that he could from others while lying down on his gold mountain and watching his wealth grow. Just then, a female elf guarding the palace came running. She called out urgently in elvish, Lord, there is an emergency. Louis looked at the female ranger and his expression sank, speak. His words were brief and concise. Lord, a group of beast men have suddenly appeared outside Dragon City. They are currently being confronted by the elven guards. Beast men? Louis's first thought was that some beast men had come to attack the city. Chapter 80 Blood Blade Clan Above the desert hung a clear sweltering sky as the sun beat down on the earth with all of its heat. The horizon shimmered in all directions, and save for short cacti which had sprung up from the shifting sands, the land showed no signs of life. Beneath the shadow of one of these cacti crawled a scorpion. It had dug its way out from the sand below and had just begun its day. Unfortunately, its day was cut horribly short as a heavy boot crushed it into the earth. The scorpion squirmed under the deadly burden but soon came to a standstill. A sharp dagger reached down and sliced off its stinger and head. Two bony fingers grabbed its corpse. Just remove the head and tail, and it's ready to eat. The voice was high but husky. Undeniably female. The woman was tall for this era. About five foot ten. Her skin tone was a healthy wheaten color, and shone with an unbelievable gloss. On her torso was a breastplate that exposed her flat belly. Her physique showed all the signs of rigorous exercise and training. And though she did not quite cut the bulky figure many male warriors did, she was clearly quite toned. The most unbelievable thing was the beautiful wolf ears growing on top of reddish silver hair. As long as one had a bit of knowledge of Sansolial's races, one would know that this woman was a beast man, or to be precise, a member of the beastman's wolfman race. She was Lys for Blood Blade, a member of the Blood Blade clan and the daughter of its previous chief. She flung the dead scorpion into her mouth and began to chew. It tastes really bad. Almost like rotten meat. Still, it's enough to fill up my stomach. The wolf girl revealed an unsightly yet brash smile. Your Highness, you should drink some water. At this time, a beast man who was two meters tall and wide came over to meet her. His head was ursine, and he carried a soft leather pouch in his hand. It was dried up, and not much water remained in it. No, try to leave as much water for the clansmen. As for me, Lisper rejected the soft pouch. She picked up a sharp dagger and cut off a part of the cactus-like plant. Then she used her dagger to dig out the ooze inside the barbed plant. She licked her dry lips and placed the ooze into her mouth. It packed a very astringent punch, but she had to make do. She waited for the water content inside the ooze to flow down her throat before spitting out the rest of it. The bearman looked at Lisper's dry lips and tightly squeezed the pouch in his hands. A trace of heartache flowed from his eyes. Her Highness grew up to live such a hard life. When we lived in the clan city before, Her Highness was still able to eat meat with her strength and identity. She could even eat white bread made from refined wheat. There were also water resources everywhere unlike now where water has become a luxury. Do not pity me. As one of the heirs of the previous chief of the Blood Blade clan and as your chief, the last thing I need is sympathy and pity. That will make me look weak. My greatest wish is to lead you all to survival. Saying so, Lisper looked behind herself. There were probably about a thousand beast men sitting under the blazing desert, taking small sips of water from their leather pouches or carefully chewing on dried meat. This was the reason why Lisper refused to drink water. She wanted to leave the limited amount that they had for her followers who had accompanied her from the city but who had suffered so much. These beast men were all different. There were humanoids with wolf heads, bear heads, tiger heads, leopard heads, and even dog heads. There were also some who only had animal-like ears and tails. They were an extremely diverse race. No one knew whether males or females had evolved more completely from animals, but they both had human characteristics. Their hands had completely evolved, and they walked on two legs instead of four. In some ways, males were largely different from females. The males still maintained the appearance of animals above the neck. Humans would definitely be unable to distinguish whether they were ugly or not. On the other hand, females were no different above the neck, making it easy for humans to appreciate their looks. The only difference was that they grew animal ears or tails. Your Highness, you are still our leader and one of the heirs of the Blood Blade clan. This novel is available on Hosted Novel. The bearman heard Lisper's words and quickly spoke in a low muffled voice. Ha 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 ha. Stop trying to comfort me. I have already lost the duel for the clan chief and my inheritance. Now, I only have my own strength and you people. 
Other than that, I have nothing. Lisper laughed out loud, full of vigor, like a wild older sister. Towards her current dire situation, she did not feel pained but instead felt acceptance at her own insignificance. My only responsibility right now is to protect you and find you a new place to live, before you all lose your lives. Lisper looked at the people behind her. Other than the warriors who had retained their strength, the other civilians already looked weak, as if they could collapse at any moment. Seeing this, the wolf girl who was completely unconcerned with herself, felt grief. She was now just a stray dog. How could so many clansmen choose to follow her nonetheless? Please do like, share, comment, and subscribe.